All right, we're in. Yes, we some are. Would say, some would say we've we've made it. We've made it. Today, Wednesday, September 20th, was the first official day of Toronto Maple Leafs training camp. Although they weren't on the ice, it was media availability day, so you had people, you know, overreacting to comments. Actually, some actual important comments were made too. So we're going to be opening or, and telling you everything you need to know for Toronto Maple Leafs training camp. As always, joined by Jason, the Karate yes, Kid Cooper. <laughs> I'm excited. Give him, we're... give him two drinks. He will start kneeing you in the ribs and shadow boxing you. Very lightly. Very lightly, though. Um, yeah, no, I'm super excited. Season's back. Um, preseason is here. Excited to kind of get the ball rolling. A lot of exciting information coming out yes. of camp so far, and we'll get all into that. But before we get into that, I just want to quickly mention, like, is this Babcock story maybe like one of the stories of this NHL season right now? And I know I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but shout out to Biz. Shout out to the guys on Spinning Chicklets for mm -hmm. reporting that. And then also shame on the, the reporters who, like, tried to push back on them because they are, like, from Barstool and they just don't like Barstool. Like, what these guys did was a player's first move. And if we're looking to protect players and make sure that they have a safe work environment and feel comfortable, especially for the young guys, like you shouldn't be going directly to Mike Babcock for this stuff. You shouldn't be going to the team's PR department for this stuff. You should be going directly to the players. And if they want to say something anonymously, they will say it. Right. And instead, what we got from these guys was a PR puff response from the Chicago Blue Jackets, Mike Babcock, Ooh. and Boone Jenner, which, by the what way, team? What the team Columbus Blue Jackets. <laughs> Sorry. You see the problem teams mix up in my head. Um, no, the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, but Boone Jenner also like if I were if I was a Boone Jenner right now, I'd be pissed off. I would not want to play for this team because you put the you put him in a terrible spot, and now he looks even worse as a result of this. So this is Goudreau too. Goudreau as well. Did he come out? I didn't see he came out and made an official he came statement. Out and did he said something. He was uh, he he told them about the interaction kind of thing. I don't know if it was yeah. official, but well, it's it's just know. it's just tough because again, like, what are these guys supposed to say? No, my coach actually is a dick, uh, <laughs> and I don't like playing for him. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll just report that, and then you will you will not see the ice for the rest of your uh, seven year career that you're here. So, um, especially anyway. when it's Mike Babcock as your coach, and he's that big of a of a prick that he would do that, right? Exactly. But, anyway, sorry, yeah, I just wanted to get that off my story, chest. Before. No, this whole story was. Absolutely bonkers. I know we're a couple days late on it. Like, what well, Babcock got fired on Friday, whatever. But and then this the was... episode came out Tuesday. Yeah, this like this whole story was absolutely insane. Uh, I'm trying to pull up the well the exact quote of one of the situations. Here's one. Um, so from Sportsnet 32 Thoughts, there was, according to multiple sources. One of the most serious concerns was a meeting that occurred away from team facilities that included several minutes of looking through a phone. That was beyond the scope of what was initially understood, understood to have occurred. And then there's this is another note. Most surprisingly, apparently, several of these incidents happened at Babcock's house in at least one of the incidents reported to Whitney. A young player was invited for lunch told to take out his phone, had Babcock flip through his photos, and then told him to leave without lunch. <laughs> that That is the craziest one. Like, that is actually, like, that is fucked up. Like, that's the only way to say it. That is, like, incredibly messed up. Like, it's... Like, it's, it's a privilege you... to coach in the NHL, and it's like, okay, like, if you can't handle it, then you don't deserve to be coaching in the NHL that's beyond that. That's yeah. sociopath level nonsense. Like I, I like I, I have no other words to describe that. Could you imagine anyone taking your phone and flipping through it? Let alone a boss, someone, a person in power, a coach, a brand new coach that has not coached one day has not a coach, one official practice, a coach that's been pretty much blacklisted from the NHL since he left Toronto because of all the stories that came out there, whether that be uh, his treatment of Chelios, his treatment, especially of Johan Franz, who made him have a mental breakdown, what he did to Mitch Marner, what he did to 
pretty much everyone that and anyone Frankie Corrado, <laughs> recurring guest Frankie Corrado, what he did to him, like just yeah. it, it goes beyond insane. It, and then it's they just, it's a bad look for it's honestly a bad look for the league because it's like you recycle the same coaches every time. This guy has a problem past. And honestly, I'm happy that he got hired and now he is fired because we actually got a piece of information from this because there was actually a lease player. And from the way that Spin Spitting Chicklets talked about this, you should go listen to their most recent podcast because they talk about it from, I believe, the 19th minute to about the 30th minute. They mentioned that there is a lease player. This was a lease, former lease player who reached out to them that originally essentially broke this story to biz. We didn't know this happened. And this former lease players said he would do it to all the players. And there was literally someone on the team. I don't know if it's a player. I don't know if it was a, a member of the staff who would tell new members of this team. Oh, by the way, Mike Babcock is going to go through your phone and your photos. Make sure you delete shit. And like, I, I again, that's me paraphrasing. I don't know exactly what the runner would say to them, but apparently this guy who Babcock saw his photos he didn't get the message and so he got fucked by babcock so like he he got like a, apparently like absolutely mentally fucked by him and he requested a trade and then it eventually ended up leading to babcock getting fired that part i'm a little the way that they describe it seems a little interesting to see circuit sequences of events because you might be able to pinpoint who the player is it's not worth our time though but yeah anyways it's just tough to see because think about the mental anguish that our, our star players have already gone through with the first round exits and all that stuff. And how much that was just probably amplified and has made their current situation much worse by this their previous coach. Who knows if it's still mentally affecting them? Because I think it would probably mentally affect me as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you find something in that... Uh, anyways. Like, they brought up a great point. Last thing on this. What if someone was closeted and, and no one knew about it and then now Mike Babcock knows and you don't want you like... You haven't told anyone on the team you don't want your coach to know. And now he knows because he's you told your through. parents. You haven't told anyone. Exactly. Exactly. And that's like, I think that's like the, the, the most serious thing to come out of it is like, like, like what, like what, who knows? Like what if that was the case? Right. And now you are exposed to someone who is a superior to you and your, and is your an entire asshole. relationship. Yeah. And your entire relationship is basically compromised. Anyways, it's enough, enough airtime for that guy. Don't want to give him too much. I don't uh, want to talk about him ever again. I nobody should talk about family, him ever yeah. again. So. No, like nobody should talk about Babcock ever again. I don't want to hear one more interview or puff piece of nonsense from that guy. Like Cam and Strick had him on, just threw him layup questions. He would lie through his teeth, and then oh, that's supposed to make him look good. Sportsnet did another piece on him that's a few that. years ago. Yeah, shame that on was Sportsnet, just honestly. garbage. Shame on that. Like this is the thing when you bring on just terrible lying idiots and you do an interview with them one-on-one -on -one, what's that like oh yeah that that person's lying yeah i'm telling the truth right now. like <laughs> it's garbage anyways moving on from mike babcock toronto maple leafs camp shall we get into it get right into it let's get right into it so before we start with any of the ash actual players that are going to be playing there are some injury. There is some injury news to be reported on. It's not surprising at all. So most of it, I would say, and that is Matt Murray requires significant surgery. As you already know, he's going on LTIR. He will not be playing this year. Jake Muzzin is also confirmed out for this season uh, due to injury sustained. I think it was against the Arizona Coyotes last year, and well, the injury was. The uh, the initial injury was that, but like it was from years and years of just wear and tear and such. So hopefully he's okay. Uh, life after hockey, I would say. Um, some injuries that are kind of newish. Uh, Bobby McMahon is injured at, right now. I don't know the severity of it. He's still recovering from injuries from last season. Uh, Ty Voigt and Braden Kressler were both injured uh, in the prospects tournament that took place this past weekend. So those are the injuries that Yeah, and I mean Bobby McMahon, obviously the biggest hit. Ty Voigt probably not gonna be ready for the NHL this year. So no, I mean, he's he's like a five nine winger. Yeah, uh, he's very, very skilled, had like a hundred points in the OHL last year. I'm excited to see him play. Uh, but yeah, probably gonna need some AHL seasoning first. Yeah, so not worried about him. Just would be nice to have that camp under his belt. Again, yeah, the guy I'm, yeah. I'm really looking at here is Bobby McMahon because 
I circled him as a guy who could potentially crack this roster. There's a lot of roadblocks in place for him. And if he doesn't crack, I believe he still has, uh, he's eligible to go on waivers without losing him. So like, should be okay. But I is thought- Is he wager, waiver eligible? Is that what you're asking? I think I, I think I he is. I don't yes. think so. Because he's 27. So I would think he's waiver. He's not waiver exempt. He's waiver eligible. Yes. So you're right. He's I'm not, not sure. Exempt. So you know what? He's not Who knows if he even gets claimed? Anyways. Um, Kyle Dubas. Okay. Maybe, maybe. I didn't realize I he was that old. So. Wow, 27. So yeah, he's a year younger because he's a late bloomer, right? He played like almost to his overager year in junior, played four years at Colgate, and then had to grind his way through Wichita, ECHL, AHL, AHL, and then finally made his NHL debut last year. But he's still looking for that first NHL goal. So it'll he come was definitely a guy I circled and I yeah. had all these notes on him, but uh, we will, we might not see him this preseason. So, yeah, I, I think the report was, if I can pull it up for a sec here, I think is that he might miss all, might miss all preseason. So there's a chance that he might be back before the end of preseason. So hopefully he is, okay. hopefully we can get some to see him in some preseason action, but yeah. Yeah. Um, next thing I want to get into is the way ins. <laughs> I think this is like a little fun because Every time on Twitter, whenever whenever a new uh, new season comes around, everyone always posts who got bigger, who got smaller. It's always like slight slight height changes. But before yeah. we get into that, I want to quickly tell you about DraftKings. We're back with another week of football, and DraftKings Sportsbook is keeping us on the NFL action with great offers every single game day. New customers can bet five dollars and get two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of the week's epic matchups to walk away an instant winner. Not epic matchups this week, but anyways. Uh, Dra- DraftKings also is not stopping there. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. Football is more fun when you're in on the action, so download the app now and sign up with code THPN. New new customers can bet just $5 to get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL with code THPN. That's code THPN. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text HOPE-NEW-YORK 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gaming. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Licensed partner, Golden Nugget, Lake Charles. 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See sportsbooks.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility terms and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions do apply. So that's code THPN for those who missed it. Back to the weigh-ins. Sorry. Um, Yes. So you have them all in front of you? I have them all in front of me. What's the most surprising uh, one? So I was going to start with some prospects and list them out for you. Okay. Um, so Dennis Hildeby, he is listed as 6'7", 222 pounds. That guy's a monster. That guy is tall. I'm excited to see him play. Other guys I was interested in, Matthew Nyes, 6'3", 217, big boy. Uh, buddy saw him downtown this year in the summer. Uh, he was... Let's say he was going for a run. Um, but uh yeah, he looked he he looked big. My buddy said he looks big and not fat, so that's good. Uh another guy I'm looking at is Topi Nimla, who's six foot nothing, 179. Interesting. Okay. Easton Cowan, most recent draft pick, 5'11, 185. So those are just a couple of prospects that we can look at, go through, have some fun with. Um, but now the fun part. The guy who gained the most pounds. Can you guess who gained the most pounds this year? Did you see this already? I already know. know. Yes. Yes. You know. know. So the guy who gained the most pounds between last year and this year was Connor Timmons, who is listed as 6'2", 206 pounds. He put on 21 pounds in the offseason. That could be like a really good thing, I think, especially if it's put on the correct way. What are your thoughts on the Connor Timmons extra weight here? You, you, well, he wasn't very big to start. I mean, he's, he's kind of tall. He's got some length to him, but I think that extra 
sort of wait was probably to help with injuries. I'm guessing that was probably the plan. I mean, they, they sat him at like the last stretch of last year after the trade deadline and said, we're going to treat this as his training camp kind of. So he kind of got two summers, we'll say worth of, mm-hmm. of training in there. Um, and it resulted in 21 pounds. I mean, there was, it, it's, I, I want to say, and I'm going to guess, and I'm going to be positive on this one, that it's not like the Tampa Bay Lightning defenseman. I forget his name, Jake something, who showed up to camp so overweight that they terminated his contract. He showed up like just Dachin? massively. Jake what? Dotchin. Dachin? Yes. Jake Dotchin showed up on a motorcycle so wildly overweight, they terminated his contract. <laughs> He was crazy. making league min. It's not like they were like, oh, yeah, need to get out of this two mil. No. <laughs> so I don't think it's like that. I think the Leafs expected him to be a little bit bigger. Hopefully it doesn't ex- affect his skating. I'll tell you that. But yeah, that's a that's a funny one. That's a that's a good tidbit right there. Yeah. And someone mentioned on Twitter that uh, Arnold Timmons was coming off a torn ACL. So could have something to do with why he was maybe losing the muscle mass from last year, maybe. maybe. Um, but another one I thought Mark was Giordano funny. Giordano was... grew an inch. Yep, Giordano grew an inch. That <laughs> one was funny at the, at the ripe age of 40 uh, years old. Um, also, Martin Jones grew an inch and put on 13 mm. pounds. A little interesting. So now 6'5", 203. Um, hmm. Another fun one that I looked at, I was like, hmm, kind of interesting. Depending on how they put on the weight, obviously. But Max Domi, 5'10", 208 pounds. That's a big boy. Well, yeah. He put on 14 never, pounds. You've never seen Ma- Max Domi? But he put, well, on, he put four, on 14. 14 pounds. Yeah, he's 208 now, man. That's massive. God. For 5'10", that's a lot. Huh. Like, That's interesting. That's like, listen. He is built like a brick shithouse. So. He is. He, but now he's even more like a brick shithouse, yeah. which like, I'm Holy so excited God. for that. because That's man, that NFL guy's... running back level. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, I actually, can't. like. No, like honestly, like I'm I'm just gonna look quickly look up a running back right Cam now. Cam Akers. Cam Akers just oh, got Cam traded Akers, today. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, look one up. But yeah, these were the heights and weights and the changes. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if they give them lunch beforehand or whatever. <laughs> or some guys have bricks in their pockets, but yeah. Two two more I want to get into though before we go. Sam Lafferty also put on eleven pounds. Oh. Okay. And then Hopefully last one is Austin Matthews, who put on seven pounds. Hopefully, it's not from from partying. Hopefully, it's put on the right way. No, it's oh, uh, and then all the change in his pocket. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then last one, obviously, Tyler Bertuzzi, fourteen pounds. Uh, all the all the all the all the guys signing new deals. Listen, that one year deal making them work a little bit extra harder. They want to <laughs> put on that weight. So, um, all right. Now let's either, let's move on to some we're either the fittest team in the league or the fattest. So yeah, exactly. Anyways, so let's let's move on from this. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just you want to talk about some guys who slimmed down or no? No, I don't care. <laughs> David Camp lost seven pounds, man. But from like, where? Where did this weight come from? He's got a xylophone on his fucking stomach already. <laughs> I don't know. I that just thought it was so funny that he of all people shit, lost the weight. Can't pinch any any skin off of this guy so yeah. then, it could be a bad then, thing he did run like a half marathon i swear yeah I, I swear he does that like every off season he like runs a crap ton of marathons and then the other guy is pontus holmberg dropped 14 pounds as well which is kind of hmm. kind of crazy um that is a lot but yeah so some guys hit that. puberty late who knows i mean in mark Giordano's case, case puberty hits at 40 so <laughs> I swear Brody grew an inch last year, so make yeah, sure good for him. This the beard happens. the beard was weighing him down. Exactly. Exactly. Um but yeah, so those were the weigh-ins that you probably looked ever so forward to. Um you got here. Look, oh, the other news that came out of training camp here was that the Leafs are going to be trying William Nylander at center. They had him at center. I mean, they listed him at center today. I don't think they were on the ice today. They're on the ice tomorrow. So expect to, to see him in a lot of 
preseason games playing center, I would say. Uh, I'm not sure if this means that John Tavares is now being moved to the wing permanently or what's going on there. But uh, there was an interesting conversation on overdrive with regards to this too. Do you think we see William Nylander uh, slotted at center for more than 40 games this year? Uh, I would hope so, yes, because why are we trying him out there if we're not going to stick with it, right? I feel like that was our problem the last couple of years was that we would try so many different things and never really give it the opportunity to stick or gel. And we'd always just revert back to what we were doing before. So, I mean, if we're going to be... If we're going to be like unsure with who we're going to, so let's, let's, let's stick with something for a bit, right? Yes. Like let's stick with it. So from the looks of it, from the, this Luke Fox tweet, he, I believe he, they weren't on the ice, but he's basing this off of the group. So the, the team is sectioned off into two groups, group A, group B, and that's all for ice time. Usually how it works is two lines from the NHL team go to group A, two lines kind of go to group B, right? It's usually the, the split here. And so, from Luke Fox's helpful detective work, he came up with the very early Maple Leafs lineup and how it would look. And it would be, I mean, the first line, we don't have to mention it, Bertuzzi on the wing with Matthews Marner. It sounds like Tavares is playing center, and it looks like he's going to be flanked with Matthew Nyes and Sam Lafferty, which is an interesting line we'll get into in a second. That Nylander line is Yarncrook, Nylander, and Domi, which is also an interesting line. And then the fourth line, Gregor, Camp, Reeves. So, I mean... Nylander at center, I feel like could work, especially with these uh, wingers that he has here. Um, one thing to note as well, I saw another tweet like this that had Robertson on the left wing of Nylander and Domi. So, oh, I mean, up in the air for exactly how these will shake out. But I just want to on... cut you off there. Sheldon Keefe says William Nylander will start camp at center tomorrow. That was from Pierre Lebrun. Yes. Yeah. So he so is like. Said it. He's yes, 100% which is, playing center. Which is part, I think, which is part of how they kind of, Luke Fox tried to like jumble and figure this out yeah. was off that information, right? So maybe we'll see Tavares on the wing, but uh, yeah, who knows? I don't know. What are your, what are your, so I feel like this having Nylander at center kind of, le and, and having Tavares at center as well leads to a different discussion of like, what do you prefer? Do you prefer more of a top nine? Or do you prefer a stacked top six? Like, what would you prefer? Because that's that's the area we get into when you separate Nylander and Tavares, right? When you have three deep lines with three strong centers, is you have the strong top nine instead of leaning into that heavy top six. Uh, that's a good question. Because it all depends. Like, when you look at the Vegas Golden Knights, obviously, then you look at that and you say, hey, I like that. Strong top nine. Spread it out. All the bet like that, that totally works. Even the Tampa Bay Lightning for the past three seasons, like it was really good in terms of spreading out the talent. But that's because when you look at each of those teams, they didn't spread them out just to, oh, we have to split these players to spread the wealth throughout the lineup. No, they were deep in terms of actually having a lot of good players. That's where a lot of people mistaken things where it's like, Oh, we need to split these two up to spread the wealth. It's like, but does it really spread that evenly? Like when you have just garbage below, you might as well stack up one line um, and try to make that generate most of your offense there. So in terms of what the Leafs have this year, I'm more confident in doing that than last beginning of last season, I would say. And that's simply because when you look at the the players that you think could play top six left wing alone. Last year, it was Michael Bunting and it was, what's his name, Alex Kerfoot. And then like maybe Callie Yarncroft, but he didn't start in the top six at all. So yeah. like, and let's get real, Alex Kerfoot's not a top six forward. So you had Michael Bunting because he worked, it, it worked the year before, right? This year, who do you have? This year... They had Matthew Nyes, who looked pretty good in a top six role in the playoffs last year. You have Tyler Bertuzzi, who looked really good for the Boston Bruins in a top six role uh, last year. And even with the Red Wings before that, too. You have Callie Yarncroft showed some promise. I would call him like a, a two plus, maybe a top nine 
we'll call him. But Max he's, Max Domi Max, as well. Max Who's, Domi, what, yeah, he. I would say he's in the the Cali Yarncroc exact sort of slot too. But it, like, I mean, last year we were hoping Robertson for a top six. Robertson's still here, although yep. the wear and tear is a little bit high on there. But who knows how he he looks at the beginning of camp? So exactly, I like the options. Would I slot? Like, think about this. If you were to do Yarncroc, say we say you do Nyes, Matthews, Marner, and then second line you're able to do like Bertuzzi, um, Bertuzzi, Tavares, Nylander, fucking whatever. I don't know. Ber- Bertuzzi, that's where it like a stop talk, stack top six is what you're saying. I don't even know. I didn't even try to do that. I'm having so much trouble put- Anyways, picturing oh, well, the lines with Nylander. So, I, I, I just want to go off of a point you made there about Callie Yarncrook and how like yeah. you weren't really confident in him being in like a top six role. He was basically okay. our sixth best forward last year to start the year. Yeah. Right? It was the big four, mm-hmm. and then it was uh, M- Michael Bunting, and then Callie Yarncrook or Kerfoot. You could argue those two. We talked about it this offseason. We replaced, we brought in Tyler Bertuzzi. We brought in a guy like Max Domi plus Matthew Nyes. That injects so much more winger depth into this team mm-hmm. that I think it makes sense that you want to go as heavy top nine because our winger depth is there. Before, our winger depth was not there. Last year was not there. Like you said, the guys we had just weren't that great. If Nick Robertson came through, maybe we could have flirted with a strong top nine, but we just lacked that win- winger depth to do so. That yeah. was the biggest issue, I feel like. So, I mean, yeah. also, I screwed myself up in saying those lines by giving two like of the better players from that pool that I, I just mentioned. So, say, say you do Yarncroc Matthews Marner, which did work at times, I would say, yep. towards the end of the season last year. Then that leaves you on that second line, that leaves you with like three different or uh, two different options for it to be a solid top six. So then you're tr- there, there's a little bit of a trickle down effect there. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of different line. Now that Nylander's at center, it's tripping me up a lot because <laughs> I didn't yeah, think it, about it, this it, until it's, today. It's hard to think of lines like that because whenever yeah. we've thought of lines, it's always had the top four, the four, the center, the two the top two centers, top two right wings are always yeah. filled in. So it was like, puzzle piecing the two left wingers and then filling out the rest of the roster. Now there's so much more flexibility and I'm excited to see what comes of it. I'm just hoping the biggest thing for me that I want to see and that I want to, um, yeah, that I want to see from this team is I want to see these guys stick with it. That's mm-hmm. the biggest thing. We're going to do it. Stick with it. You can play around preseason. Fine. Mm-hmm. Season starts. Give me at least like a 10 game stretch at the very least. Yeah, exactly. And to go more off of that, when you look at Sheldon Keefe's tenure with the Leafs and his experiments of William Nylander at center, when did it come? First one in Sheldon Keefe's first season, game five, elimination game against the Blue Jackets, he decided that's the greatest time for Nylander to start playing center again. Okay, awesome. Didn't work out. Next time, I believe it was last year, he gave him... The Nashville Predators game, which was very, very up and down. Well, not very, very. Nylander had a good game, but he lost his man on one of the goals, and it resulted in the back of our net. But then he was, he assisted definitely on the game winner. I can't remember who scored the first one. It might have been, it wasn't Austin Matthews because he wasn't playing that game. And then the, who was it? The Devils game, I want to say. Was he playing center that one? Honestly, but it couldn't have been more than back. three games, three or four games. Yeah, they didn't. They, they didn't test. It. They didn't test it out at all. Like, no, three games is not enough for me. Like, I need ten games because in those three games, what if you play Arizona, Arizona, and like Chicago, or Arizona, yeah. Chicago, San Jose, or inversely, what if last year you were playing Boston, Tampa, uh, Boston, Tampa, Florida? Right? Those are okay. two completely different three stretch of three stretches of games, right? And one game. And just skew the entire set there if, yeah. if it's one bad game or one good game. So my question to you is now, playoffs 
say we're we made it through the regular season. It's playoffs tomorrow. Is Nylander playing center in the playoffs? Do you think this will actually work? Do you like Nylander at center? I've if you've been listening to the show for a long time, you know that I've always wanted Nylander to play center on that third line. Ooh. I never thought it made sense putting him with Matthews. That Tavares line has never worked. Yeah. Never, ever, That's ever true. worked. It was strong offensively, black hole defensively. I'd prefer them just to be split up. If Nylander, if you want big money, carry your own line, right? I'm not saying that John Tavares was carrying him, but all yeah. all the other guys can do it on their own. I need to see William Nylander be able to do it on his own. Like he, I know he can. I know he can do it on his own. He just has to show the team that he can do it on his own. And I think it's better for the team if he does it on his own because he's good enough to do it on his own. Does that make sense? I feel like I said the yeah. same thing like four times, but he's good enough to do, do it on his own. Do you think he's good enough? Do you think he's good enough defensively to play center on his own? Who cares? The other line is shit defensively, cares. anyways. Other he the other lines, whenever whatever line he is on is going to be terrible defensively. That's it. That's like a, a given. He's never played on a on a on on a line on the ice it where they're worse not though. Get, it can get worse. Sure, maybe it could get worse, but how much worse can it get? He uh... X his expected goals against. Relative to the team is always poor. No matter who you, no matter who you put yeah. him beside, it's slightly higher. That's expected goals. What about actual goals? Just because it's a blown coverage and you've given up a breakaway, it's a blown coverage and you've given up a backdoor one timer. Listen, I, I don't think is a lot more responsibility but... defensively, and he hasn't been able to show as the at the wing position that he can play defensively. And now we're moving him to center. It raises a lot of questions. I think the questions are definitely valid. I, I I hear what you're saying here, but I think the way that the Leafs play neutral zone and D zone defensively is very fluid in that there's no true C goes here for uh, winger goes here, winger goes here, right? I think it's a very fluid process of filling in your gaps. Will there be mistakes where he doesn't fill in his gap properly or get to his spot correctly if he's an F1, two, or three? Probably. But I don't think yeah. because he's playing center, that means he's going to be down low in the slot every second of, of defensive zone uh, play where he's trying to cover the guy in front of the net. I That's what I think. It'll be interesting to see what happens on the ice. I just don't yeah. think that if you play center, you only play between the dots. That's not, that's not the way, at least defensively in the NHL, the NHL works anymore. It's a lot more fluid. The system is more fluid defensively, I think. It is, yeah. I mean, so I I, I get your concerns, but those those issues would happen if he's on the wing or the center center position, regardless, right? I think they're I think they're more glaring at the center ice position, and I'm just going to quote Sheldon Keefe also yeah, on fair. this one. He mentioned that last year he thought he he put Nylander at center to get his feet moving. You remember that part? Yes. Then yes. he mentioned that he moved him off of center because they liked his speed more, and he was able to use his speed more on the wing. You're able to more so be um, well, in this circumstance, he was able to be more of the that first out winger okay. or that first out player. Um, whereas at center, you're not always able to do that. If you're keeping him at center, his greatest defensive strength is carrying the puck out. Yes. So now if you're taking that out, like there's your your well, step down defensively. I'm very curious to see how this works. I don't like it. I think preseason will be somewhat of an inclination how it works, but preseason is not the regular season. I mean, last year we saw Dennis Malgin play as our best player and look how that worked out. So I'm curious to see, and I, 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 I'm fine. 10 game runway to start the season. Sure. Nylander at center. I would rather them, them do that than just one game and then pull them off and then maybe put them game 41 when there's an injury, put them back at center for one game. Give him a 10 game runway, but will it work? I'm kind of leaning towards no, if I were to guess. Fair, fair enough. Just one last thing on that. You mentioned that he his greatest skill is exiting with the puck. At yeah. the center, he will be then the first pass from defenseman to forward. So we're almost eliminating a pass for him to get the puck to exit the puck. Possibly, so yeah. I think it might actually that that will probably ex accentuate his greatest strength defensively. I just again think like listen if if his D zone yeah, struggles are going to be true. his D zone struggles off puck it's not going to look pretty but it's not going to look pretty either way so um but anyways moving past that 
I'm curious to hear Ni- your thoughts about Nyes and Robertson because I mentioned the Fox tweet yeah, where he had Lafferty, Tavares, Yarncrook. Mm-hmm. But one of the possibilities that Myrtle tweeted out was Lafferty, Tavares, Nyes, and then Nylander, Domi, Robertson, which I that think... That would be the worst defensive line in the league. I think it would be such a fun line to watch, though. So, anyways, besides that, are you buying or selling Nyes Robertson top nine? And I'm packaging them together to make it way harder for you. Because not it's basically, are you buying or selling Robertson in this opening day roster? So, the thing is with Domi and Robertson, I'm just theorizing here. I'm not, like, I'm just based on what I've watched of them in the past. Domi's really good on the puck. I don't love him off the puck as much. He's, he is really good on the puck because he does have those skills, but I feel like he lacks like a, a hockey IQ, we'll call it. Robertson, I feel like, is the same-ish way. You don't really see him create too many chances off of the puck. It's usually when he's got the puck on his stick, right? But So that's where I question if those two will work together unless Robertson's really been studying film this past off season, um, will Robertson make the opening day lineup? Um, I feel like he's definitely going to give the coaches a difficult time. Similar to last season. You remember where did he start last season? Started with the Marlies. Did he play well in the preseason? Hell yeah. He was fantastic in the preseason. The only reason he didn't make the team was because he was waiver exempt and Dennis Malgan was not right. So I feel like he's gonna, they're going to give him, the coaching staff, a difficult decision to be made. I wonder if they feel that he's old enough now where it's like, oh, we can put him on the fourth line and only play him 10 minutes. Or if they see it as, this guy missed more than half a season last year. We need to get him games and we need to get him minutes ASAP. And then we'll, uh, we'll figure things out after five games or so, right? So... Yeah. I would put it 65% not making the team. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Are Probably you happy 70. with Math? Are you happy with Matthew Nye's? You think Matthew Nye's top six to start the year? Top six, that's interesting. I top six to start the year. That's a really good question. In terms, I'm very high on Matthew Nye's. I think he's going to have a fantastic year this year. I think he's going to be that missing depth scoring that we've always been hoping for. Does he start in the top six? Um, I think they're going to give Bertuzzi a good look in the top six, especially, you know, with Matthews and Marner. Although when you think about it, like this is a loose comparison and it might not even be a good one. It's just one that I kind of have in my head. The Dallas line of Robertson, Pavelski, and Robertson, Pavelski, and Rupe Hints. We have the puck carrier. Then you have the two other guys that are really good. Uh, not the greatest skaters, but really good around the net, really good with the puck, really good shooters, the whole nine yards. Like Bertuzzi and Tavares aren't the greatest skaters, but Nylander's a great skater. To, to, I think Bertuzzi's such a smart player. He could complement them very well. So that could be one. But yeah. I think for sure the top line... I, I'm willing to bet that the top line is going to be Bertuzzi, Matthews, Marner. And the second line is a fill in the blanks. If Nylander's now at center, do they, I, if Nylander's going to start seize the season at center, I think Matthew Nyes will be top six. If he's not, mm, I drop it to 45% top I, six. I, I think it's almost a hundred percent that he's in the top six. I think. Yeah. And the only the only okay. instance where he wouldn't be in the top six is if he's not on John John Tavares's line. He's on William Nylander's line, and that's gonna yeah. be the, that's technically still the top six. I'd argue, but he'd be. I list- think a hundred percent top nine. Yeah, right? yeah, a hundred percent top. Like he was playing top nine in the playoffs. So yeah, I, I I think that's fair to say. And he's like without a doubt gonna be on this roster. So it's gonna be a fun, fun freaking year watching like it's it's good because we've literally it's funny how long have we been doing this we haven't had an opportunity to be excited about a prospect ever make the yeah, nhl michael bunting okay mike is michael bunting a prospect 26 years old fine rookie of the year fine fine he, he deserved the rookie of the year that year he's, he wasn't even, he's not even 
No, he's not even <laughs> eligible for rookie of the year because he played playoff games. Uh, that's a great. No, I don't. Think I, I think he is. He played he is? seven okay. playoff games. Correct. Yeah, seven playoff games, three regular season games. The rule is either you can't have more than six games played in two consecutive seasons, which is what happened to Robertson for last year, or twenty six games played in one season. I think something like that. Yeah. So well, I think he's okay. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's the funniest he's gonna, I think well, ever you, you was Delkovic. Like... Nive- Delkovic was nominated for the Calder Trophy. And then the next year was eligible again. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's so crazy. That's just with that's the, they should adjust that for goalies, but it doesn't matter. Um, it was, but you it know was, that you know what I'm saying. Do, it had to do with the shortened season and whatever. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, oh, okay, I see, I see. But yeah, you whatever. know, you know what I'm talking about here with Matthew Nyes. Prospect who we drafted recently comes up and is going to play for us. That literally hasn't happened that? since the big boys played played for us. Because we've had false hope. We've had like Robertson oh, yeah. up and down, injured, whatever. Oh, yeah. We had false hope with Rasmus Sandin. Yep. For sure. Who Timothy was... Lilligren, I guess, is I'm I'm forgetting. But other than other than Lilligren. But again, that was false having hope. One, like, having they, one they played prospect... five minutes a game, whatever. Yeah, having but having one prospect graduate your system Pierre in Abel. five years is not no bueno. That's no bueno. It's well, cool, yeah, I guess. when you're trading all of them, it makes sense. I mean, like look yeah. at Trevor Moore. Yeah, that's another yeah. <sighs> Anyways. Was Trevor Moore the mystery Babcock player? Oh, man. Maybe. Who knows? Okay. We'll have to do more research on that. Um, Ooh, creep myself up there. All right. Let's, let's move on to guys we're keeping an eye on this preseason. I think the best way to describe these guys are either guys coming off injuries, probably, yeah, more so guys coming off injuries and yes. bubble guys who we don't currently project okay. to make the roster, okay. but have a chance to make the roster, right? So, one guy I was looking at, I'll, I'll leave first because you have a glutton of names and I'll just let you fire them off after. But one guy, obviously, I think the most obvious one is Connor Timmons. Where do we oh, see him yeah. play? Right? He carries a one point, what is it? $1.2 million 1. cap 1. hit. $1.1 million cap hit is probably the most likely to get chopped because I believe we're still over the cap a little bit. Yeah. So that's something, something to keep an eye on, keep note of as preseason goes on. But I mean, if he stays on this team, I don't want. I don't want Mark Giordano playing every single game like he did last year. There was a clear drop off from his performance towards the end of the season uh, compared to the beginning of the season and especially in the playoffs. Maybe that was usage. Maybe that was over usage. But well, I think he played poor. Like he dropped his play declined. Do you remember in December when Riley and Brody were out? Him and Justin oh, Hall yeah. were running like 20 some odd minutes a night. That was insane. This guy, they it were was, running was, this guy into the ground and they didn't give him a night off until like the end of the year. It was crazy. And I think part of that is Mark Giordano's fault because I feel like he, he's so he is, competitive. Yes, exactly. He doesn't want to sit. He doesn't want to sit. But like you need to sit down, Mark Giordano, and say, listen, this regular season does not matter to us. We want to win you an yeah. effing cup. The best way for that to happen is for you to rest these games. And on top of that, resting these games gives Connor Timmons a chance to show his stuff and prove to us that he might actually be good. So yeah. that's the big, uh, that's someone I'm keeping an eye on in preseason. If he can prove himself to this team that he's worth the dollars he's getting paid right now. Not saying he's not worth it, but again, we're in a cap crunch. Someone has to go. He doesn't want to be the guy gone. He's going to try to prove that he's not the guy gone. And maybe he is the guy gone and he goes play somewhere else. But yeah. depending on his play, there could be you know, a lot of things for release. Someone might pay a good amount for, like, not a good amount, but someone might pay for him to have him on their team, right? Who knows? Probably a six or a seventh only, unfortunately, because pick, hey, a, with our picks, a pick is a I pick. Know. But the, the shitty thing is when he played last year, outside of that Boston game where they put him with Riley, which that was a, it was, I think that was a little bit too much too early, too soon. Connor Timmons was awesome last year. Offense, I know, oh, you look at the points total only, whatever. In the defensive zone, too, I thought he was really good. I was really, really impressed with Connor Timmons last year. I mean, we, we, he was like a, like a prospect, a low end prospect swap last year. He barely played at all, like the past two years. It was really questionable. What, what can we expect from Connor Timmons? Do we just get him to fill another Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds kind of section there that was missing from Kyle Dubas's void? But he played way above my expectations and if we lose him for nothing that's really going to be unfortunate because if you put him on a lower end team such as Montreal 
or if you put him in back in Arizona or you put him even, you know what, the Florida Panthers maybe could use him in a yep. depth role. I think sure. he's going to do – like if you put him in the right spot, if not if you play him 25 minutes a night, okay, he's going to get rinsed. Uh, but if you put him in the right spot, I think you could really have a nice little piece there. So that's a great pick there, Connor Timmons. Yeah, and and again, like you said, he's for sure an NHL player. So I think I he's. So. Yeah. I don't think he's a seven. I think he has a chance to be a six or greater. Yeah. So, um, one hundred percent. Be interesting to see how that one, how we navigate Connor Timmons, and two, the salary cap implications heading into this. Uh, off season. But and yeah. you had you had a couple other guys that you like that you want to keep an eye on for forwards, Marcel. Uh, Oh, on forwards. Uh, who Noah Gregor? Yeah, a couple forwards and a couple D, right? My couple forwards I had was Noah Gregor and Bobby McMahon, right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a whole slew of guys to take a look at, but Listen. Noah Gregor is coming to the Leafs on a uh, professional. I don't know why I keep private. Tr- no, a PTO. He. We don't have any contractual obligations to him, but he is invited to camp right now. He played last year with the San Jose Sharks. By all accounts, Corey Schneider actually said that he is the king of getting breakaways and missing them, which was kind of funny. Uh, so there's that to his game. He provides a little bit of speed. He hits a little bit too. Um, not all that much in terms of offensive production. I don't believe he would count as a veteran in the AHL, so that would be interesting there. But I think the Leafs, how many contracts do the Leafs have? Do they have a contract for him? They have 49 out of 50 contract slot taken mm. tr- contract slots, excuse me, taken up right now. So I wonder if they want to keep that flexibility though. They pro- I'm like that's where if they're at 49 of 50, I feel like he's kind of the odd man out. Uh, but I'm very interested to see how he plays. Uh, I haven't watched him a whole 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 lot, but I think that speed in the bottom six will uh, will definitely bode well. But yeah, my one player that we're not going to be able to see that I was really looking forward towards was Bobby McMahon. I did a whole video watching of him this past off season too. So really sucks that he's not in preseason or hopefully he gets in the last game, whatever. Uh, but what we're getting with Bobby McMahon, this guy's upper body is huge and he's really freaking strong. Like to the point where his ability to shield uh, defenders from the puck with just using his upper body is re- pretty damn good. I would say his biggest strength in terms of he's a goal scorer. You're not really going to get much playing making out of him. He doesn't really have that passing ability and vision to get pucks to pass pucks into the high danger areas. It's more so going to be by skating it into the, the high danger areas. A lot of actually causing turnovers at the, uh, uh, what would it be at, you know, at the blue causing turnovers at the blue line, going the other way on a breakaway. Uh, but a lot of goals also from the bumper position, really good at receiving that bumper pass and ripping it. Cause his shot's got some good velocity to it. Um, also getting good body position in front of the net on the defenders using that big frame of his, where his deficiencies lie and where you're going to see a lot of inconsistencies in Bobby McCann's game is, as I mentioned, he's not very good He's not a very good passer. You're not going to get that offense from him, unfortunately. Um, so that, like when you cut the offensive ability in half like that, that's where I feel like there's going to be a lot of inconsistencies because you're you're kind of one-dimensional in how you generate offense. You are kind of dependent on your teammates a little bit too much there. So that's where the fourth line role, I think, would be suited to him. He does bring that physicality a little bit too, which is nice to see. Um, Another thing that kind of, I would say, is a weakness to his game, his entries. Um, For a guy that, you know, he's he's a decent skater, especially for his size. He doesn't like to come off of the boards, off of his entries. And when you do that, it's easy for the defenseman to angle you off. And it leaves you with limited options in terms of creating offense. So you'll see better skating players will get to the middle and then create offense from there. There's a lot more options. Bobby McMahon doesn't really do that. Um, you will see him skated into the offensive zone, rarely pull up, which is not the greatest sign. You'll see a lot of him skate into the offensive zone and keep skating around the net 
try to shield off that player with his upper body to create some time. But unfortunately, more often than not, than not, he doesn't make that decision quick enough to then move the puck. And it's often just then a puck battle from there. But he's, he's also pretty good at interrupting plays with his stick, but not the greatest at winning all of those interruptions. So that's where I, th- I think Bobby McMahon could be an okay fourth line option. So we'll see what he does, but we're going to have to wait on that one. Yeah, but fair Bobby enough. McMahon. And I like that breakdown. Hopefully he's back soon. Um, I think with the pieces that we have yeah. in our bottom six, he could compliment in that he's unique compared to majority yeah. of them in his, in his ability to generate it's one dimensional like you said but he, he could be a good complementary piece to those yeah. guys because they don't generate the same as him and then you want to get into two defensemen as well who are not on ptos yeah. but on potential ahl deals might might three. mix in three defense three guys we, oh. we oh. signed three defensemen i see I- them want to say they're all on one ways i can't remember simone yeah. benoit who played all of last year with anaheim uh, Will Lagason, who played all last year with the Chicago Wolves in the AHL, and then Maxim Lejoie. I think he got three games with Carolina in the NHL, and then the rest of it in Carolina's AHL defi- uh, AHL affiliate, the Chicago Wolves, as well. Uh, I'll start off with Lejoie. He did play with Ottawa earlier in his career, but hasn't really been able to find a permanent NHL spot since. Uh, he's pretty good at sifting pucks through from the point. Like he he's got some pretty good edge work to him, I would say. That's where and his hands, I would say, uh, I would say, I would say, I would say, <laughs> his hands are pretty good too. Uh, like not the most tremendous shot, but just does a good job of finding holes from the point, and that's where a lot of his production is going to come from. Um, decent, like his skating's. His, I don't like his speed. His, he really needs to work on his speed, and that's where. You mentioned he lost weight. That could help him. However, I don't, he, he doesn't, he's not very big and cannot, can get bullied off of the puck pretty easily. Uh, I think it was the, the game that I was watching from him in the NHL, he got like off of chip ins. He lost the puck battle far too often and struggled to move the puck from there because he didn't have that speed to, to skate the puck out. So that was unfortunate. Like he's an okay mm-hmm. passer, I would say. And lastly, in open space, if you do give him a bit of space, he is able to make a guy miss and make a play from there. But I, overall, he's going to be like an 8-9 offensive-leaning AHL defenseman. Um, then the other one we have on here, Will Lagason. I got to watch a little bit of him today and yesterday. Kind of got a bomb of a shot. I, I'm really hoping to see him let one go from a good spot in the preseason because. I have a good feeling it would go in the net. He's got some good velocity to his shot and his one time's really nice too. Um, with Will Legacy, I feel like he's not quite an offensive. He's not an offensive defense, defenseman, I would say. He's like a meh defensive defenseman. So I, I almost want to put him in the same slot as like what a Justin Hall is, right? Yeah. Like, was Justin Hall an offensive defenseman or a defensive defenseman? He was like, eh, everything. He was like, eh, everything. <laughs> like, <I>, legacy has <laughs> got some size. He does a good job of, you know, when he's got a guy on his back, using that size to shield uh, shield the defender from the puck. Um, I like how aggressive he gets around the net in terms of trying to beat guys up. It's pretty nice to see. His issue, again, he's not the greatest skater. I'd say he's okay-ish, but at times has trouble passing the puck um lacks offensive iq so is not many passes up there i would say too and that's where he can kind of get stuck in his own end similar to justin hall actually so um yeah i just saw way too many comparisons to justin hall with it but that's not bad for if you're playing in the ahl i mean lejoie had 45 points last year as a defenseman and lagason had 10 goals and 32 points so some good AHL defenseman, AHL defensive depth to help out our goalies last year, uh, or to help down help out our goalies down there. Dennis Hildeby, as you mentioned, right? Um, yeah. And the last Could one I good. have on this list, Simon Benoit. Um, he played on a very bad uh, Anaheim Ducks team. I don't think Simon Benoit is very good either. <laughs> like. <laughs> I didn't see him make a lot of good plays in the game I was watching. 
Yeah. I think this is a Jordy Ben replacement. He's going to be in the AHL. Uh, just, yeah, like, I don't know. From the stats, he's a fi- he, he can fight a little bit. He can block shots and he hits. I just did not see much from the tape. They were playing the Oilers, and I, I, I didn't even see him chip the puck out. Yeah, and at the <laughs> at, at the it. at the very least, though, he played for the Ducks. So terrible team, terrible system, terrible everything. So I maybe a player. maybe maybe a little bit of structure can help. Um, but what are you going to develop? He's not a good skater. He can't puck handle. He's not that smart. Well, those hands, know. those fists. I don't know. Um, you, you, exactly like you said, though. Defensive Jordan depth, replacement. AHL, whatever. Yeah, seven, eight, ninth defenseman. You, he, he has a pulse, and he can skate in the. Yeah, if you NHL see all of these defensemen in the NHL at the same time, you just know like there was a or, the plague went through the Leafs room. We're screwed. Yeah, are, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we're screwed, kind of thing. But yeah. those were the defensemen they brought, like the depth defensemen that they brought in that we haven't talked about before. Like we've already talked about John Klingberg, one dimensional offensive defenseman that has got some great edges to him. And right? another thing, keep an eye on him in the preseason. I can't believe yeah. I missed him in the line. I think LeJoie, like if you if you get LeJoie the puck in the offensive zone in the preseason, I think he can put up some points. Like again, Legacy, you give him a good playmaker on that line, he gets some open space. He can rip one home here and there. Simon Benoit has fought before. He can fight. That's good. He's fought. Um, that's uh, that's what I got. About it though. Yeah. Yeah. Like Noah Gregor, I think could have some success in the preseason, especially with that speed. Like the thing is with the preseason, like it's this is the NHL. The preseason, because you have these AHL players in it, or some of them even, le- or some of these guys are going to end up in the ECHL this year. It's a tick below, so everything is just tick below what the NHL would be. So, if you have kind of that something that's good, it's amplified that much more. Like just think of Dennis Malgan last year; he had good physical skills to him, could handle the puck pretty well, was a pretty good skater. So he was able to put up some points where his deficiency really shone or shined in the NHL during the regular season was that he was dumb as hell and he could not play defense worth a shit and he didn't know how to move the puck on time. And that just torpedoed his game. So with some of these guys that I just mentioned, they're, they're AHL. I would say AHL plus the first two, they're good AHL players. So they could have some success in the NHL preseason um in the regular season not so much kind of doubting it simply because they're like they're all 25 and how much more developing you're doing at 25 but we'll see yeah yeah good for the should be, system should be good couple guys we gave you there who will be should be on your radar maybe um yeah. keep an eye on and yeah i can't believe we forgot to mention the d pairings for uh like when we're talking about lines i was just focusing so focusing on the forwards with all the new pieces that we got yeah really forgot about how they're gonna shake out with so i think this is a talking point though this is the defense is a talking point i'm hearing from a lot of people the leafs d sucks the leafs d is below average the leafs d stinks blah 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 blah. whatever bunch of womp 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 i don't care what other people think do you think the leafs defense is a top 15 defense in the league is this a top 15 decor in the league Yes. Is it a top 10 decor in the league? Probably not. Ooh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Where do you, th- like, are you confident? Efficiency confident lie, you- lie that we don't yeah. have a number one. Um, okay. Yeah. And then the our strength is that we have, I'd argue, two, sorry, we have four to, yeah, probably about four at minimum number four defensemen in Lilgren. And Giordano okay. in, um, in McCabe and in Klingberg. I, okay. And when I say number four, I mean literally number one is a top 30, like, like number, like a, a, a three, four is, I guess, what I'm saying here. Okay. Right. I think, I think that's fair to say for all those guys. Some of them obviously higher end, some of them lower end three fours, but I think three, four is fair. So listen, okay. it's having two pairs of three four is good no but then also you look around the league and see that who the hell is florida the florida panthers starting on d forcing is their number one and then that yeah, and that's are, are they making the playoffs is that the standard 
Florida I don't Panthers. know, but they they were just in the cup finals, and I know that someone was hurt for yeah. them. But, I mean, take a look around the league. Not defensive. Everyone thinks their D is yeah. stronger than they actually are. I think our, ours true. is pretty fair 15 to 10. I think that's fair, right? That's a, I would say that's pretty fair. I think the that people are underrating the Leafs defense right now simply because of what we saw at times in the playoffs. I we didn't a hundred percent did not see Brody at his best. I think he was injured. He was, and he was dealing worst. with something. He yeah. was he was terrible. He couldn't turn certain ways. And in game five, they had to put him back to his strong side because you know, there was just so many issues to his game, right? That's number one. He's one of he's probably debatably our best defenseman. And he was not at his best. So that's where the opinion of the Leafs D is kind of clouded in that sense. Number two, Jake McCabe. Jake McCabe was solid in the regular season. Him, yeah. him and Brody together, people were like people were going nuts over that line. They were playing so well together. They complemented each other so well. They're both two really good defensive defensemen. How did Jake McCabe look in the playoffs? He looked horrendous too. Was the speed too much for them? I'd like to not think so. But like, I just think back to an 82 games, 82 plus game sample size of these guys and what they actually have shown in the regular season versus those five games. I, I'm going to take the 82 plus games of regular season play and how, how well they both played. Like those are two solid defensemen. No, Morgan yeah, Riley. Only, yeah. People now, now we get into the opposite end of it. What was Morgan Riley's regular season opinion? People were saying scratch him for playoffs. And by people, I mean kind of us. <laughs> that was, that was, I, mean, I never said to look scratch at the Leafs him. record without Morgan Riley. Come on. Okay. Last I never said to, the, not even to look at the I never record. said to scratch him. I always said better. to dial back his minutes. I never said to scratch him. Okay. You're, you're walking it back. We said, uh, when, that did, when did I say to scratch sucked. him in the playoffs? We said that Morgan, not in the playoffs, but we said oh. that Morgan Riley stunk last year because he did. He did. Realistically. He, did. he stunk in the regular season horrible. last year. Then he played well in the playoffs. Sure. Which turned it all around. Is he yeah. just a playoff performer? I don't, I don't fucking know. I, I don't, don't know, know what, how to, what to make of what we saw of that ascension, but his D partner's unfortunately gone. So I don't know what the hell that's going to happen. What's going to happen there. But Morgan Riley, like, I don't know. What's Morgan Riley? He's like a, a three, four, I guess to your point as well. That's three, three, four ish kind of guys that we just mentioned. Um, Giordano. Again, that's another guy that played like ass in the regular season or sorry, in ass in the playoffs, but he was solid in the regular season. He yeah, was and, solid in the regular season. Yeah. And, and just to contextualize it again, though, we did suffer through a lot of injury through that decor throughout the season. So maybe that's like a ripple effect of it. Ooh, it's tough to say, point. but this is a good talking point that we should focus on and keep our eye on throughout the season. Yeah. Yeah. Just look at like, go through the Leafs decor, look at how they played last year during the regular season and then make that assertion because I turned on, I forget what channel for 15 seconds before I turned it off and they were like, Someone mentioned Jake McCabe, and it was, oh, that guy didn't look good in the second round. Okay, the second round's five fucking games. Yeah. Did, and, like, and, uh, how do you, that, how do you look in 82 games last year? Listen, we're going to hear that a lot this year. No one looked good in the second round. Not a single player. No so it's like, like I don't know. Like, Joseph yeah, Wall. they didn't look good in the second round. No one did. Like, Yeah. You know who else looked terrible? Carolina in the third round. They all looked bad in the third round. Holy. Like, like <laughs> yeah, they did not. Martin Nakash in the third round looked like he lost his marbles. It looked like exactly. he didn't know so, he was seeing ghosts. That was thousand yeah, percent. Yeah. But anyways, we keep going down the list. John Klingberg. We'll see. That's a big wait and see one because he had a tough. I mean, he's he's just such a wild card. I don't know what to make of this guy. So it's going to we'll be see how that fits. And if he plays with McCabe, it times. should be it. Yeah. I'll, at I'll, times, I'm it, at times it will with. be fun. At other yeah. times, it will not. Yeah. But uh, definitely a better player than Eric Gustafson. I'll throw that out there. Um, and then Timothy Logan, hopefully he makes another stride. It's been slowly but surely, but every year he's been getting better, I would say. Right? And he looked good in that time filling in for those minutes when those guys were hurt. So that was that's a good little 
stretch where it's like a good thing for him. Yeah. The only thing pre, I worried about. Yeah. Go pre ahead. deadline. Pre deadline, he looked really he good. He did. And I think the only thing I'm worried about is that he might be the guy who kind of needs minutes to do well. I know it sounds like a little counterintuitive, but it seems like when he has less of a feel for the puck and gets those less minutes, it seems like he just is not in the right headspace to play well. Because he did not that's like true. and down the stretch when he started to lose his minutes. I think that's when we saw the decline. Maybe I'm assigning an outcome, like I'm I'm assigning that to the reason. Like maybe I, I'm wrong in assigning that reason as to why he was declining. But I feel like we've seen with Timothy Lilligren that he's been able to kind of take those opportunities and play better and elevate his game when he gets a little bit more minutes. Whereas when he starts to lose his minutes, the play goes down again. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't mean that that's an exact correlation, but something I noticed. No, what you said makes sense. I mean, it is definitely a feel thing from the defensive position. Um, Just the two things he really needs to work on. There's times when he has the puck and pressure's coming and he just kind of like backs up with it and puts himself in an awkward position. And then we saw him whiff more than a few times last year. Yeah. And then also picking up the puck uh like when the other the opposing team dumps the puck in and there's four track pressure on him he needs to be way more decisive with the puck and he needs to be kind of quicker on it in terms of picking up speed under the puck and then moving it from there because under heavy pressure he's still kind of struggling so but i do definitely do i would agree with what you're saying with the the yeah. minutes part i mean look the the drop off point in his regular season was clear cut Right after they brought in other defensemen, he stunk. Like, yeah. doesn't take a rocket scientist to to dissect that one. Um, anyways, so if you were to compare, whose decor would you rather have? The Leafs, as we know it right now, which is Morgan Riley, uh, TJ Brody, Jake McCabe, John Klingberg, uh, Mark Giordano, and Timothy Lilgren, or would you rather have the Senators' decor, which is Thomas Shabbat? Jacob Leafs Chikrin. Decor. Ooh, that was quick. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Right now, yes. All right. Good answer. Because I feel like, oh, you know what? It's a little tougher. Yeah. Shabbat, Chikrin, Sanderson, Zub, Brandstrom, Hamannick. Listen, they, they have us with Chikrin and, and Sanderson, but everyone other than that, Pass on all Shabbat's of them. not a bad player. Even Shabbat. Shabbat's just the worst version of Morgan Riley. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's just right. my take. Spicy take. Maybe. All right. It's an interesting one. Or maybe he's exact uh, names. I don't think. I don't really think he is. He's been getting worse because of injuries, but. Okay. That's a that's an interesting take. I'll take the Leafs too. Sure. Why not? <laughs> um. <laughs> So closing it out, do we have any guesses on what the lineup's going to look like? I have. I honestly couldn't even tell you. It's. I think it's too early to tell for me, and I'm not even okay. gonna. I'm not even gonna make a stab at it just yet. I'm gonna wait till we have some information. Use that information instead of just blindly throwing darts, because I feel like I have no idea. Honestly, it's yeah. too hard to tell right now. It's way too hard to tell. There's too. Before it was easier because of, like I said, the the center right wings locked in top two spots but like right now it's so like way easier. too hard to they, tell yeah they they threw a, a whole ass wrench into it with william nylander is now going to play center so daily faceoff it. has it, pro- it projected as this tyler bertuzzi austin matthews mitch marner line one line two max domi john tavares william nylander okay whatever line three matthew nice david camp Callie yarncrock line four Sam Lafferty, Dylan Gambrell, and Ryan Reeves. Defense, Morgan Riley, TJ Brody, Jake McCabe, John Klingberg, Mark Giordano, Timothy Logan. That's a pretty good guess, I would say. I don't know. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah. It's going to be fun but, to see, though. Yeah. It'll all unfold in the preseason, which starts Sunday, 2 p.m. One head to head with Sunday night with Sunday football. What are you, do? what are you doing, know. Leafs? What are you doing? Kind of dumb. Anyways, Anyways, two o'clock Sunday, September 24th, game one, game There's two. Th- games in Australia, too, or some shit like that. Wait, what? You didn't hear. 
there's a couple games being played in Australia. The Leafs are playing in Australia? No, like just no, not NHL the Leafs. Games. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, there yeah. are preseason games being played yeah, okay. in Australia. Yeah, I heard that. I don't know what time they're at, but I won't be up for it. <laughs> I did that one year. It was uh, the Flames and Bruins in China, and I actually, I actually stayed up until two a.m. to watch it. Respect. But was it a, was Saturday, it a Friday so- or Saturday night? <laughs> Yeah, I was. I didn't have work, <laughs> work the next day. But Saturday, September 23rd at 12.05 a.m., NHL Global Series, the Kings and the Coyotes are playing in Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll watch it. Who Probably knows? Not, I'm, not, I'm not watching nah. that. No. Nah. <laughs> Sorry. But anyways, any other points, any other things to look for, any other takes and such? That's it for me. All right. I have one last thing. Uh, Sam Lafferty, I've talked a lot about him. I'm really curious to see how he looks this year. Last year, regular season, he looked horrible. Last year in the first round, he looked horrible. But then against the Panthers, you saw a little bit more from him. I was watching, it was the Le Joie game. The, the game in the NHL that he, the full game, because he played 13 minutes one game and then like four minutes another and four minutes one after that. So I just watched the 13 minute one, which was against Chicago. And I was like, damn, there's a player on Chicago, like good four check pressure, finishing his check, like really fast. Guess who it was? Sam Damn Lafferty. Up. Love it. <laughs> I was impressed by him. And I was like, ah, he's, he's reeled me back in. So curious to see with more, time with the team how he he performs this year so just when you thought you're out he he reeled me back in oh we didn't even talk about the goalies um yeah goalies going into camp samsonov we did a whole episode on our we did a whole episode go listen to that episode if you're interested about the goalies yeah pretty much samsonov (laughs) wool hill to be martin jones vladislav pets pexa and i think that's about it yeah those are the relevant ones so yeah, go listen to the episode with Ben Cerna for that one. Anything else? That's it for me. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Go, Lee, go.